see we have our attendees coming in great i guess we'll just give it a couple 30 seconds not a full minute as zoom gets its life together um Let's do some. Let's just get started. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us on our panel on um, union organizing in the progressive space. Uh, very excited that we are all here today, um, and we're joined by some awesome panelists who we'll introduce in a second. But I first just wanted to set the stage a bit of what um, union organizing in this space has looked like to me, at least, in the past few years ish. Um, I. I think we've all seen that it's really picked up in this nonprofit campaign and progressive space, which is really great to see. At Action Network, we unionized it back in 2019. ActBlue organized recently, ACLU, and dozens of other organizations have joined um, Nonprofit Professional Employees Union, Campaign Workers Guild, and many others. So today we're going to discuss our experiences in our unions. Um, the future of unions in the progressive space and beyond, and hopefully encourage all of you to organize in your workplaces. So I'll have the panelists introduce themselves, name, um, pronouns, your day job, and just some background on your union experience. Um, Nerithia, do you want to start us off? Um, sure. Just a really quick apology for any background noise. My apartment is next to the train, so uh, if that happens... Uh, my name is Narithia Anaconda. I am an executive council member for CWG. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, and my current workplace is New Blue Interactive, where I am an uh, account coordinator. Awesome. Thank you for joining us. And Haley? Okay, I don't know if my sound just cut out, but I think I saw Amy's mouth moving. So I'm just gonna go ahead and introduce myself. Um, so my name is Haley Brown. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. I am a research associate at the Center for Economic and Policy Research. And I am also the president of the Nonprofit Professional Employees Union. Great, thank you. And um, my name is Amy Chinlai pronouns are she, hers. Can you hear me now? Am I back? Okay, great. Um, uh, pronouns are she, hers. I am day job as a software engineer at Action Network and Action Builder. Um, and then I am VP of representation for nonprofit professional employees unions. So work closely with Haley um, to make sure our stewards and our bargaining units have the resources they need to have great contracts and enforce those contracts. So let's um, start off with um, our first question. So um, my vague plan here is maybe like 30, 25-ish minutes of questions um, from yours truly. And then we'll have 15 minutes for um, audience questions. And I know that unionizing, especially if you're here in your workplace setting, um, can sometimes be a sensitive topic that you might not want to put in the chat. So my email is always open if you want to discuss further offline. So Haley, we'll start with you. Um, what motivated your workplace to organize? So full disclosure, I was in the super privileged position, at least at my current workplace, of uh, coming in once it had already been unionized. And that was a breath of fresh air for me compared to the numerous workplaces I had uh, previously been in that were not unionized. But I can speak a little bit about my understanding of what the motivations were. Um, so uh, the Center for Economic and Policy Research, I'm going to call it CEPR from now on because that's what what their, the acronym is, I'm going to lean right into the whole labor union acronym thing for my workplace too, just for this bit. Um, so CEPR was actually a fairly early adopter within the progressive um, think tank world uh, of having a staff union. Um, they shortly followed uh, the Economic Policy Institute or EPI um, uh, towards the beginning of uh, the nonprofit professional employees unions lifespan. Um, and it has been really exciting to see how uh, a local that was comprised of maybe a couple think tanks has, has grown to encompass so much of the progressive nonprofit space. Um, to speak a little bit about some of the motivations, I know that both CEPR and EPI uh, do a lot of research on unions. Um, 
I know I, in my capacity at CEPR, a lot of my research is on unions and the benefits of unionization. And I think that it was a really great opportunity for them to, to, show, to show a commitment to the research that they were seeing and to really live their values. That's great. Um, and North, yeah. I also got lucky in that I joined uh, both of my past unionized workplaces after they'd already um, been unionized and began negotiations. Um, I will say as an executive council member for the Campaign Workers Guild, who the people, the organizations that come to us come to address sort of three main issues. Uh, the first one being sexual harassment. Um, there's often very little uh, HR processes in place for campaigns. Um, so there's a failure to address this. Um, campaign workers are also consistently overworked and underpaid um, with very little guarantee of hours that they'll be working or stipends for their work. So inappropriate compensation. And then lastly, they all usually come to find a way to have a voice at the table for their campaign or their firm. Um, many, a frequent issue is that the only way to give feedback is like one-on-one -on -one meetings with the campaign manager, executive director, which is a very intimidating process for workers. So unionization addresses that in those three main areas. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think on campaigns and other places too, when we started out as, you know, seven employees back in 2012, and now we're at almost 30. Now in 2022, we really lacked those processes you were talking about, Narithia, where we didn't have processes in place for harassment, for um, promotions, for uh, reviews and things like that, that especially as these um, organizations get bigger are really important to address. And especially in a campaign environment where um, it's more short term and people have the, it's yeah, a more revolving door of a workplace. There's, um, I feel like less motivation sometimes for management to employ those practices. So I'm really glad y'all are stepping up to the plate and getting that done. Um, so just some background on Action Network and Action Builder and how we came to unionize back in 2019. Um, we just saw, like Haley said, a need for us to live our values. Um, we wanted to show that not only are we progressive in the partners that we um, support, but we are practicing those values internally as well. And we um, wanted to have more transparency in the organization and um, more um, insight into decisions being made. Um, and the future of the organization, especially as we knew we were going to grow a lot. So um, Jeff, who has been um, leading this conference, uh, me and another coworker um, who has since left, uh, forms the organizing committee. We bargained, got our contract in 2020. And um, <laughs> uh, now we are about to start negotiating our successor contract. Um, and it's been a blast. I think. Um, we should take a moment and celebrate some of our wins. Um, and Haley and uh, Narithia, feel free to speak on some for Campaign Workers Guild and NPUU um, uh, more broadly. But I think specifically at Action Arc, one of the greatest things we've seen is um, uh, our harassment and discrimination articles. Um, we have processes for that that actually let people, you know, switch um, switch supervisors if it's a management case, um, which we haven't had to use, but it's good to know it's there, right? Um, we've been able to hire a really great DEI consultant team um, to work on equity in the organization. We have a great shared planning committee um, and the, the overall transparency that we have with management has been really great to see. Um, so Nerthy, if you wanna start us out this time, what are some of the successes you've seen recently? Um, I like overarchingly, if that's a word. <laughs> That uh, we've seen a better, like an increase in standard for what is normal for campaign working conditions. Um, so there's definitely been wins um, that have helped all of our units. Um, we've also been able to address better salaries and raise salary floors, fully covered health care costs. This includes for both trans affirming as well as reproductive care. Um, having appropriate sick leave as well as COVID related uh, packages, um, 
having severance packages. Again, we are campaigns, so a lot of them end. Uh, and so having appropriate severance packages in order to maintain stability for workers has been a pretty big win. Our uh, organizing model is worker-led and volunteer-led. So our members are advocating for themselves in these negotiation meetings. It's not just someone from the executive board. So a lot of our wins have been really specific to um, organizations and firms and campaigns. You know, One campaign wanted to make sure that there was always cheese and snacks available. And so they got cheese and snacks. <laughs> so empowering your members has been a pretty big win. Um, as well as, like I said, sexual harassment, we have made structures for discipline, for complaints, for reporting. This way, uh, people have an avenue to speak out. And then additionally, because we are, our members are not at will and are just cause employees, uh, they can speak out without fear of being fired um, for reporting sexual harassment or any other form of discrimination. That's great. I'm so glad the cheese and crackers were provided as well. Um, Got to have some sustenance with those long hours. Um, Haley, what are some successes you've seen recently? Yeah, so I actually I'm enjoying how much um, overlap there is between the successes in the campaign world. And I think the successes that we've seen in, in, the, in the, the, the broader nonprofit world. Um, I think that the point that was made about uh, about being member led and making sure that the wins that you're getting are specific to the needs of that particular unit. That's an ethos that MPEU has really tried to incorporate as well. And I think that it's really important, especially since we represent a pretty, like at this point, a pretty wide variety of nonprofits. Nonprofit workers who are doing advocacy in the field are going to have different needs in terms of workplace protections, in terms of what they wanna see um, than somebody like me who works at a think tank. Um, the other thing more recently that I think has been really, uh, really gratifying to see and really important and, and really sort of shown the importance of having a union at work has been the COVID-19 COVID pandemic and how much upheaval that created. And by having a union in place, um, it's given us more uh, agency when determining what the what our new work workplace is going to look like when everything was shut down we by having union structures there we we were in a position where we could bargain with our employers over what the COVID-19 changes would look like rather than just having rather than just being told what those changes would look like and I think in a lot of cases that has resulted within NPEU and my impression is beyond NPEU that has resulted in improved workplace safety policies uh, better work-life balance for workers because the idea of what of what a workplace needs to look like has expanded significantly. Um, and I think that that has, it's really shown the power of, of organizing with your coworkers and having a, having a union, having a contract, all of those things are really important when you have major crises come up uh, that are outside of your control, like a worldwide pandemic. For sure, we've been negotiating at NPU a lot of um, return to work. Um, MOUs, uh, mem memorandums of understanding for organizations that um, have been incredibly effective at giving the union a voice, like Haley said. Um, and hopefully we never have to do that again. But um, yeah, I don't trust public health. <laughs> I do trust public health. I don't trust germs to not happen. That's what I meant. So moving on. Especially unionized public health workers. <laughs> yes, yes, we, we love our public health workers. Um, um, so I think working in the progressive space has its challenges um, occasionally, especially when you're organizing, right? Because we have these um, organizations that preach progressive values or campaigns that preach these progressive values, but maybe they don't always live it. Um, and it might not always align with their actual internal practices. So I guess my question, I'll turn it back to you, Haley, um, is how has working in the progressive space impacted your union? And why do you think it's important that organizations like ours unionize? Yeah, so I, I know we've already touched on the living our values thing, but the other point that I would like to make is that a progressive job is still a job. I think in some parts of the progressive movement, especially in the nonprofit space, there's this idea that mission-driven work 
and unionization are maybe in conflict with one another and that if you really care about the mission, you wouldn't necessarily be making demands on your employer. But people who are doing mission driven work still need to do things like pay their rent. A lot of us have student loans that we need to pay back and treating acknowledging that progressive work is still labor and that the workers doing it deserve to be appropriately compensated. They deserve to have the same rights as other workers doing other types of labor. I think that that's a really important starting point for, for understanding why or organizing in the progressive space is every bit as important as it is in other spaces. Um, a progressive boss is still a boss uh, and mission-driven work isn't necessary, isn't work that people can afford to do for free. And it's still work that can come with during the COVID-19 pandemic. If you're doing it in an office, if you're doing it in the field, it's still work that can come with significant safety threats too. So I, the pandemic showed us that much more that progressive work is, a progressive job is a job and for the workers doing those jobs deserve appropriate compensation and protections. Yeah, um, totally agree with everything you said. Um, Narithya, what about you? Um, yeah, I'm completely in line with that sentiment. Uh, CDVG is nonpartisan, but of the progressive workspaces that we do organize, um, we do feel like there is this, and, and honestly, this is applicable to a lot of campaigns, but like the idea that unionizing is like the opposite of a social good because you like ruin the campaign's PR and then the other candidate wins and now everyone in that district is screwed over. But it's so it's like, if you want to help the people of this area, don't unionize, don't speak up. But that's not really like how things should be, you know? Even if you work for a progressive workspace, you still have labor rights. You still have working workers' rights and those deserve to be acknowledged. Um, I do feel like there's also the issue of like how, of the attitude towards unionization and what that process feels like on the management's end, it's often very emotional. And um, in our experience, there's been a lot of crying at meetings for management, uh, which is an uncomfortable thing to sit through. But like for us, it doesn't, for like work workers that are unionizing, it's not a very like, personal insult to unionize. And it's not um, saying that the organization's bad, but it's saying that the organization has capacity for change. It's saying that, you know, there's structural things that need to be addressed. Um, and everyone who unionizes wants to work at that place um, and wants to make that place workable and livable. Um, and additionally, there's always the challenge of what negotiation and bargaining actually feels like. It's a very time consuming, um, emotionally consuming task to do on top of your full-time job. Um, rebalancing power, rebalancing control is never easy. Um, and that's a challenge that is still applicable even in progressive workplaces. I'd like to add one more thing on this topic, if that's okay. Um, and that's that, so the nonprofit space ha in, in a lot of cases has traditionally been something where the pay is significantly lower than even the public sector and definitely the rest of the private sector. Um, and it has been a place where, where basically the expectation is if you believe in the mission, you're willing to take a pay cut for the mission. And that has meant that there is a lot more turnover than there needs to be and that um, hiring is a lot less inclusive than it could be otherwise. Because if you're somebody with a lot of student loans, you can't necessarily afford to take that that so-called mission-driven pay cut. And I think that unions in the progressive space are doing a lot to make the work more sustainable and make the work something that people who have student loans, people who might not otherwise feel like they can afford to come into the progressive movement in that way, feel like, that that, feel like that's a job that they can take, that they can do sustainably. Um, and, and I think that unions are making a big difference in, in making the progressive movement more inclusive in terms of the people who do the work behind the scenes too. Yeah, both of y'all had excellent points there. Um, I wanted to add on a couple of things that um, my brain is completely blanking, but we recently had a um, contract signed where a salary for is 60K, which um, is, pretty good um, for an entry level staffer. So we're very excited about that. Um, and I really liked what you said, Narithia. And I wanted to add on that um, 
just something that you uh, said, uh, having a capacity for change, I think something that a refrain that we've heard a lot is, well, you already have a good workplace, you have good benefits, why do you need to unionize? Um, or you're only here for a short period of time for a campaign, why would you need to unionize? Um, and so what both of y'all said about um, you, you're a worker, as long if you are in a workplace, you deserve to unionize. Um, love to emphasize that. So moving on, um, what do you see as the future of union organizing in the progressive space? And Narthia, you want to start us off? Sure. I mean, just more of it. I think we're approaching a time, especially after the COVID-19 crisis of like workers are realizing their value and therefore their power. Um, in the ideal, like we would be able to go to bargaining tables and like reach an agreement and every side come away satisfied. Right now it's still a very um, like power struggle back and forth. And ideally, I think we would, it would be nice if we reach a place where there's more of an openness to rebalance that power. Um, and I definitely think that we're kind of headed in that direction, this like normalization of being in a union, because more and more employers are realizing that unions are good, actually. They help address issues and gaps within the organization. They give workers a voice. Um, and yeah, they just, they make things work better. <laughs> they help the org, they're good. And so I think we'll see more of it. We'll see more workers wanting to empower themselves and we'll see more. Uh, employers being open to that. Yeah, I would just add from like my first hand experience with my own employer um, as an organization that's had a union for a longer period of time, we've had management express that they are grateful that the union is there, that the union gives them a structured way to figure out what their staff is thinking. It gives them a way to more successfully uh, manage their staff uh, because they, they have that structure in place. Um, I think that sometimes for managers, it can be kind of a scary thing because it feels like you're being asked to give up power because you, in some sense, you are being asked to give up power, but ultimately it can make the overall organization and the fulfillment of the mission run more smoothly when there is a union there. I also uh, completely agree that I, I also see um, union union organizing in the progressive space continuing to grow. I know that at MPEU, we um, are receiving a very steady stream of high interest from people in various organizations uh, who are interested in organizing. Um, and we have grown significantly even in just the past three years. Uh, so I I think that that organizing will will start to slow down when we start running out of nonprofits. Um, but that I don't see it slowing down much before then. Definitely. I mean, there's always going to be new nonprofits, always going to be new campaigns, some more unions to have. Um, and then more broadly, um, I think, you know, we've seen Starbucks, Amazon, um, Trader Joe's, even Medieval Times um, try to form a union in the past um, few months-ish years. I have no concept of time. Um, and on top of that, you know, during the pandemic, we saw teachers um, really show their power to um, protect themselves during COVID. Um, and most recently with the rail work, Railroad Workers Union um, fighting for basic necessities. Um, so how do you think um, that unions in our space intersect with the broader union space? And how do you think we can improve that relationship? Okay, I can go. I don't want to just like, I don't want to just jump in, but I'm happy to go first if we're not assigning things. Um, so I think, first of all, some of the stuff that we've already touched on about how there are a lot of, there's a lot more overlap than maybe some people think there is between workers in the nonprofit space and workers in the rest of the private sector and the rest of the, the labor market in general. Um, nonprofit workers are workers just like other workers. We have a lot of the same um, concerns that about compensation, about time off, about sick leave, about workplace protections. Um, uh, we have a lot of similar concerns to workers in all sorts of other types of workplaces. The one thing that I think may be a little bit more specific to the nonprofit industry is the mission-driven aspect of it. 
Um, but I, in the sense that that the purpose of the work is is mission driven rather than necessarily profit driven for a shareholder you'll never meet. So it seems it can sometimes feel a little bit more close to home. But if anything, that just makes nonprofit workers that much more invested in their workplaces, and it makes sense that there's that much more unionizing happening there. The one other thing that I want to add, and this is this is me putting on my researcher hat a little bit, is that um, a lot of workers in the nonprofit industry tend to skew a bit tend to skew a bit younger. Not all of them, not every part of the industry, but there is, in, especially in some cases, especially if you're looking at like research assistants at think tanks, they tend to skew younger. And there's research showing that there's a pretty substantial uh, union wage premium and union benefits premium for younger workers in particular. And I think that workers are starting to sort of look around and realize the power that a union gives you to negotiate on things, on those sorts of kitchen table items. Um, and that may be contributing to to increases in, in organizing among that group, especially, and that group tends to intersect with the nonprofit industry age-wise. Yeah, I think that the growing movement and sentiment we just discussed of progressive workplaces wanting to unionize is a part of a larger trend of the entire country realizing that you know workers have more value than what they are being credited for right now. Um, and it's, you know, unionization is a collective action. And so that includes a collective amongst multiple unions. Um, there, it, unions exist to support each other as well as its mem as well as their individual members. So um, the work of any one union is not necessarily isolated from the other unions. Uh, you mentioned the railway workers, what happened in Congress and with their policy being signed is concerning to every union everywhere because it undermines the process of the democratic process of a union and compromises everybody's ability to negotiate if that sets a precedent. Um, so, you know, every union should and usually does advocate for each other in order to ensure that our collective labor rights uh, are protected. Yeah, um, I love what you said about um, you, all the different unions working with each other. Something I noted, I'm not on Twitter often, and especially now that, you know, it's doing the Elon Musk thing. Um, occasionally I'll pop on and it's funny how- They should unionize I, too. Right? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, we'll help. Um, we, <laughs> once I started following a bunch, you know, just my fellow officers, other people in the union space, of course, the algorithm is showing me a bunch of um, union related items. And it's been so interesting to watch uh, unions from all different sectors, from all different parts of the country, um, with all different missions, whether it's, you know, make more money for the rich or eat the rich. Um, it's been so great to see um, different organizations come together for workers to show power. Um, and I'm hoping that's something we see more and more um, is, other, is everyone supporting each other. Um, awesome. Cool. So yeah, we also all have the same internet mascot at this point. Like Jorts is there for all of the unions all of the time. And I think that 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 is another thing that in terms of the nonprofit space intersecting with the rest of the labor movement, Jorts is absolutely a bridge between those two. So we have an internet cat on our side. <laughs> yes. Um... <laughs> So um, other than adopting jorts, um, what advice do you have for folks who want to organize their workplace? Norithia, you wanna start us off? Sure, um, advice is that it is worth it, that um, it really does give you a way to have a voice in your workplace that if you feel trapped by your working conditions, that's a way to solve that. Um, oftentimes people really care about what they're working on, but the struggle is, as you mentioned, they have student loans to pay and can't afford to work on it for free. So this is a way to, you know, gain back some of the agency that is often taken away in hierarchical structures. Um, it's tough. It is hard. <laughs> um, there are moments where you go into bargaining and leave very, very exhausted, but in the end, um, it's absolutely worth it to be able to work with your coworkers in a collective. It's not as scary as it seems. You have the support of both 
your coworkers, because like when we say the union, it's you and your coworkers together. You also have the support of other labor activists and other organizers, um, and there are resources for you to find where and how to unionize. There's always help available if you're interested. Um, yeah, that's what I would say is important to remember. Yeah, I, th I would also add that the first step is talking to your coworkers. Um, talk just to be clear, talking to your coworkers about your about your workplace conditions and about organizing those are protected rights of yours. I would still advise discretion because it's it's better not to find out what the procedures are for enforcing those rights. But the first step to organizing your workplace is talking with your coworkers, getting an idea of of what people's how what people see as the problems in your workplace, how they'd like to go about fixing them, and then. Um, reframing that and realizing that a lot of the problems that that feel like individual problems often tend to be systemic ones and they're not just you and talking to your coworkers is a great way to to for you to collectively realize that and figure out a way to collectively address your collective problems um i also just want to quickly plug that if you are a nonprofit worker and you are interested in organizing your workspace uh please get in touch with us we actually run a webinar that goes into detail about how to organize how to start organizing your workplace it's, it's an exhaustive amount of detail but i would highly recommend it if you're interested in getting more information and you're not sure where to start yes um second the plug for the webinar um great so i guess we'll open it up for q and a i see we have a question already in our queue but please throw your questions in there um so we have um, William asking if we can share some different tactics and values. Oh, let me do click the button. Uh, different tactics and values um, on how construction organizers specifically um, could introduce more diversity into the construction industry. Um, Y'all have any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I think unions are a great way to address diversity issues. Unions cannot solve mm -hmm. racism, but they can address structural forms of inequality. Um, so for us, for campaign workers, there's often this huge burden to like relocate to work on a new campaign, and there's usually no fiscal support. And minorities don't really have that kind of like leeway to do that. You know, I'm a kid of immigrants so there's like two people that can house me um and uh so you know putting in stipends to make sure that like certain expenses that come with the job are covered is one helpful way to make sure that marginalized people working class people are able to get opportunities for women enforcing things like reproductive health care maternal leave sexual harassment policies, those are great ways to structurally address barriers of entry. So um, unions are definitely a great way to negotiate on these issues and make them implemented um, in your workplace. Yeah, yeah, I, th I agree with all of that um, put much more eloquently than I could. Um, the, what, the thing, so for the construction industry, there are some other things that I think, so construction, specifically tends to be very disproportionately male. Um, and part of that could be the long hours, the lack of safety protections, those types of things, um, especially with respect to childcare, a lot of times that disproportionately falls on women. And if a job is not giving you adequate paid time off, not giving you adequate time off, period, um, it makes it really difficult for women to break into those spaces. Uh, so. I think this is something that I've, I've heard it discussed um, in, in the disability context, but I think it applies in a lot of contexts. There are a lot of things where for some people, it's a nice to have. So like if you have people all over the country who can house you, a moving stipend, like that's great. You It wouldn't be a deal breaker if you didn't have it, but it's really nice if you do. But it's the difference between other people being able to take the job or not. And I think that there are a lot of policies that unions can advocate that will uh, be nice if, they, if they're universal. They're nice to have for everybody, but they are make or break things for people who are underrepresented in those industries. Great points. Um, fantastic. Um, other questions from folks? 
We have a fun compliment. Thank you for the person who told us that we rock. Um, <laughs> love affirmations. <laughs> Okay. Um, do you have any experience with transitioning? Oh, I need to click the button. Okay. Experience with transitioning a nonprofit to becoming worker self-directed nonprofits um, with a cooperative decision-making model. Um, this person works at a nonprofit worker center that recently unionized the staff. And one of the demands was to move to a model. Um, that was more similar to a cooperative decision-making model. Very interesting question. Um, Haley, do, do we, do you have experience in that? I have some thoughts. If um, not. I have, I have some thoughts too. Um, so first of all, that sounds awesome. Kudos to you. That's fantastic. Um, I don't know if at MPEU, we have any places that I know of, Amy, please correct me if I'm wrong, that have gone quite that far, but we do have examples of organizations where shared decision, where more shared decision making and more agency for workers and more input into decision making for workers has been a big priority. Um, I will say, for example, CEPR, we have a voting member of the union. There's a member of the union who is a voting member on CEPR's board of directors. Um, that was a big ask that we had a, a while back. And uh, having secured it makes us feel like we really have a lot more agency and a lot more input into decision making because Super's board is fairly small and having a worker on that board is incredibly important to us, especially a voting member, not just a sit in and watch member. Um, I know that that's been that type of an ask has been a priority for some of our other units as well. Um, another way that this again, this isn't moving quite to a cooperative decision making model but workers having more voice within their nonprofits with respect to accepting money from specific donors and who the funders are going to be has also been a big priority. Um, there have been uh, complaints at some of the nonprofits about the types of donations being accepted and how those donations don't necessarily accord properly with the mission and the reason that those workers would like to work there. Um, so, those types of concerns have been at the forefront for many of our units, and we have had some successes um, in getting them addressed in our contracts. So not quite full worker co-op, but but definitely more shared decision making. Yeah, I think that's a great point you had about the board seat. That's actually something we tried to negotiate in our contract. And unfortunately, we were not even able to get um, someone to sit in on those meetings. Um, hint, hint, nudge, nudge. Um, <laughs> So um, yeah, and I think going along with the cooperative decision-making model, um, I know we have um, at least at Action Network, so we have like cooperative development model with our partners, um, which the staff doesn't necessarily get like, it, the union doesn't necessarily get the, uh, like a vote on um, what features get built and such, but we do get to advocate for things. Um, so, but that like takes a lot of structural change um so well I don't have an answer for you I can also think of some organizations that do have a more um worker um compatible model I don't know if they want me to shout them out so if you want to connect privately um Krista we can totally talk about that um any other questions from folks I would just quickly add that um, I, just because we don't get it in one contract doesn't mean that successor contracts don't exist. So we have gotten lots of wins in some of our contracts and the worker agency and input is a big priority for us in uh, upcoming contracts for many different units. For sure. Um, well, I believe we are at time. Um, Norithia, thank you so much. It was a pleasure having you. Haley, always a pleasure as well. Um, thank you everyone for watching our um, 
panel. And we also have our um, reception happy hour tonight at 530 at the Bus Boys and Poets on 14th Street here in DC. Um, I think Jeff threw a link in the chat. Yes, thank you, Jeff. Um, so please come to that um, if you are able. Um, I will be there before pickleball. <laughs> but thanks, everyone, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much, Amy. Yeah, thank you for having us.